Hey everyone, happy, what's today? Happy Monday. I just made it back. Um, I tried to rush and sit back down before it was 8.01. I'm going with the, uh, I got a water bottle this time, so I don't have my, uh, I don't have my chalice of water that I usually have, but uh, welcome to the stream. Welcome to Mastermind Academy. Um, tonight we're gonna be going over programming with Golang, but as usual, we're gonna give people a few minutes to kind of get in, uh, get, get set up, get, you know, sit back, relax, grab yourself some food, Grab yourself some water. Um, I like to do a roll call though. I saw somebody was here from Reddit. Um, I posted last night, I po or yes earlier yesterday, I posted in Reddit, um, just kind of on a whim, just to um, in the in the DevOps uh, subreddit, um, and I got a surprising amount of interaction, a surprising amount of uh, of people kind of respond to that. I still have to reply to uh, to a lot of those uh, questions. But yeah, if you're here from Reddit, definitely let me know. Um, welcome. Um, I know you may not have seen the first two uh streams but that's not a big deal at all again yes um thank you dark lord uh for, for letting people know the very first one was just a syllabus session and the second one was kind of a, a very uh, high level introduction to programming you can definitely watch uh through that later but you'll pick up a lot of that stuff here um as well but yeah we'll just we'll, we'll chill for another minute or two um let people get set up um and then we'll get started. Um, tonight's, I'm actually really excited about tonight. Tonight's kind of the first hands-on session. Tonight's the first time. Um, you'll probably really be confused on some parts of it, if this is your first time kind of hopping into this stuff, hopping into programming. This is the first time I think you're gonna be really challenged, um, but I think we're gonna get through it. I think it's gonna be fun. Um, I think we're gonna have a, you know, a good time over the next week um, trying to learn the stuff, figure this stuff out, implement it. Um, and we're gonna be using um, a lot of these concepts throughout the whole course. Um, but again, not with not particularly with Golang, but we're gonna be learning, we're gonna be using these programming concepts throughout the entire course. Um, yes, uh, the video on demand will be available for, I think, so it will be, it will for sure be available for 14 days afterwards here on Twitch. Um, I think it's up to 60. I'm, I may not be eligible for that tier yet. I'm still trying to figure that out. Um, I, I will be trying to post these to YouTube. One of the problems is the music in the background. I need to figure out a way to strip those out. So all these are being recorded. Um, hopefully I can strip the music out. Um, some of the older streams that I did kind of back in December and January um, actually got copyright, like copyright striked. Um, so I'm trying to figure out a way that I can upload these and not get them copyright striked. So... Um, but the video, I will find a way to get um, everyone the video on demand, even if it's just through the S3 bucket, uh, through like an S3 bucket uh, that you can download the stuff um, or find a way to keep it up on here on um, on Twitch for a while. Um, yeah, no, not, not a problem at all. Yeah, I, I know people, I know this is not a perfect time for everyone, so uh, I, will, I will figure out a way to make them available at all times. But for at least 14 days, um, you can kind of catch up on these things. Handbrake, handbrake like the like the application to uh, to convert videos. Uh, what was handbrake mean? Um, absolutely, yeah. Like this for 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 those of you who don't know, we started doing this. Uh, my, my brother-in-law and I started doing this uh, back in I think December. Uh, we just were doing some coding challenges and stuff on here. Um, people kind of asked for a little bit more structure, uh, so we decided to make this DevOps bootcamp because. Um, Everyone always asks me, I'm a DevOps engineer, uh, for those of you who are new, um, people always ask me like, how do you get into this? And I was like, you know what, like I, I, I can point you to some resources, um, but it's probably easier for me to show you. So I decided to expand on that. Um, and that's kind of how we got here. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll, I'll use Handbrake and see if I can strip that out. Thank you. I, I do use, uh, I do use Handbrake. Um, I, I actually prefer, you know, free and open source software. So, um, so handbrake, I, I definitely have that available for me to use. Um, Aerosmith, thank you for the subscription. I really appreciate it. Uh, what are the 10 programming concepts that must be learned regardless of the languages? So that is absolutely, those those concepts, that's what we're gonna be learning over the next week. Um, although we're using Golang to, to kind of do this, um, these are, I'm using Golang for very specific reasons that we will talk about. There's a slide specifically on why we're using Golang, but this is, uh, what I want you guys to take on for this is the concepts, not so much the syntax, not so much specifics with Golang. So like, we're not even gonna talk very much about Golang or uh, some of you who may know Golang, we're not gonna get into the kind of specifics of how to set up your 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 workspaces properly and all that. We're not gonna do much of that because we're focusing on the concepts. Um, we're really gonna be, so someone, um, I guess the, someone 
told me a story once about uh you know adding tools to your toolbox to be able to build a house um so that's what we're gonna be doing here we're gonna be you know learning how to do one thing and that's gonna be your hammer and we're gonna learn how to do another thing and that's gonna be your nail um and eventually we're gonna be able to put all this stuff together and you're gonna be able to do that no matter what um programming language you decide to go with it whether it's python whether it's javascript you'll be able to use these tools uh, after this um golang is just a great language to kind of start this with um, also, there's a few extra commands um, in the command box tonight um, to help people get some stuff installed once we get to that point. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll talk about that as well. The cool, do you have a Twitter or some way to get in touch with the outside Twitch? Absolutely. So all of my social media, let me put this in here. All of my social media is at, um, is at mastermind.io. So Twitter slash mastermind.io, YouTube. Uh, Instagram as well, uh, LinkedIn as well, uh, slash I slash mastermind.io. Reach out to me on any of those places. Um, I need to put a, a thing in here for my email. You can email me directly as well. Um, with, and that's abrooks at mastermind.io. Um, reach out to me. Um, I'll do my best to get back. I, I was telling people the first episode, um, I'll, I'll try to get back to you within 24 hours. I'm going to really do my best to get back to people within 24 hours. Um, so cool. Sounds a little low. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, let me know if the sound if it needs to be turned up. I can turn up the mic. It looks like it might be clipping a little bit, so I don't want to turn it up too high. But definitely let me know. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, sorry about that, I-95. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I think the sound should be good. I haven't really changed it since last time, cool. All right, so let's get started. Um, since tonight's gonna be hands-on, um, let's get started. So. Finally, programming with Golang part one. Ready, set, Golang. Let's get right into it. So first, just a quick introduction to what Golang is. So Golang, it's an open source uh, programming language. So open source meaning that the source code for it, we talked about source code last time, definitely refer back to the last video, um, the last stream for source code. Um, but that source code is available. It's, it's, it's open and it's available for you to see and for you to contribute to if you'd like. Uh, we'll talk about contributing the open source code later as well. Um, but this is this is a free software um, that you can kind of pull down. You can see how it's written. You can see all the things um, that take place inside of it. Um, but it makes it easy to build a simple, reliable, and efficient software. Uh, it was designed at Google. Um, it's kind of why it's probably called Golang, but uh, it was designed at Google by uh, these three guys, Robert Grismer, uh, Rob Pike, and Ken Thompson. And so it was created out of Google um, specifically to solve some problems that were specific to companies of Google size. You know, Google has, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of servers, um, they're transferring data across the world at, you know, very rapid speeds. Um, so they wanted a tool uh, that they could use to be able to solve that. So uh, Golang was kind of born out of that and has been building ever since. Um, I didn't put it in here, but um, Golang is relatively new, is a relatively new programming language. It was created in 2009. Um, and again, it's a statically typed compiled programming language, all concepts we talked about last time, but that just means that uh, the types um, inside of Golang, we're gonna be talking about types tonight. Um, it, it, it checks those types um, and it's very strict about what you can do with those types um, and it's compiled, meaning that um, uh, we have to compile this into machine readable code. Um, we, so we compile it down from source code into machine readable code um, so that the computer can read it. Uh, that, so that makes it, uh, that makes it pretty fast and efficient to run on computers. Um, but it makes it a little slower to make changes. Um, we'll see that Golang, even though it's a compiled language, has some cool tools um, and is built in a way where we can kind of use it like an interpreted language. So why are we using Golang? Like a, a bunch of people have asked me this, and I think it's a great question. I knew the qu this question was coming. Originally, when I created this, we were using Python. Um, and I may try Python for the second iteration of this, uh, but I wanted to go with Golang because it wasn't until I started learning Golang that I think I that I think I really under, started to understand um, programming and some 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 of the deeper concepts um, that you kind of have to go through using Golang. So one, it's compiled. I think you have to. I don't think you have to. I think it's good to start with a compiled language because I think it's easier to go from a compiled language to uh, to an interpreted language. So I think it's easier to go from something like Java or Golang or C++ into something like JavaScript or uh, Python um, or Ruby. Um, and I think I think it's because uh, compiled languages are a lot uh, usually a lot more strict. They're usually statically typed, um, and there's some concepts in there that um, that are pretty important. 
Um, again, statically type types are very important. Types are very important across all programming languages, not just statically typed ones. Um, so I think it's important to be able to practice, you know, understanding what types are. Um, and this this is the biggest one for me. I probably should have put this one first, um, but Golang, you have to be very explicit in what you're doing. Um, it doesn't try to figure out what you want to do or what it thinks you want to do. You have to be very explicit in all the things that you're doing. Um, and it's also built in a way that um, they don't really add much fluff to it. You have your standard library of tools uh, that they give to you, and um, they, they feel like you can solve all of your problems using those tools. Uh, so you you got to be very you got to really know what you're doing um, to use GoLang. But it's also very readable. So although you may have to write a little extra code in comparison to another language, uh, it's very readable code um, in comparison to uh, especially other uh, compiled languages or other statically typed languages. Uh, but it is it is very readable. Um, no magic here at all. So <clears throat> if we were to do JavaScript or Python or something, we may import a package and use it and it may do a lot of crazy stuff and you may not really be able to understand what that thing is doing. Um, so I think it's, it's a good place to start. And we're not gonna get too crazy. So I think this is a good place to start cool so first thing i want to show you all is the go playground so after this after this slide we are going to try to get golang installed um, if you're following along real time but you don't need to install go on your computer to do this um to, to kind of follow along tonight go has a playground called uh the go playground where you can go let's get out of here really quick and let's go to that url all right. So what what the Go Playground is? It, it it's a it's an environment for you to play with with GoLang. So you can write all of your code here, and I'll make this a little larger. But you can write all your Go code here, and you can format it, and you can run it. So the formatter um, just kind of makes all the code um, look right, so it'll put it back in in place. Um, don't worry about imports right now. We'll get there. Um, and if you want to run it, you can run it. Um, pretty simple. So you can hop right on right on the go playground play.golang.org and you can participate in everything that we're going to be doing tonight i am going to try to use visual studio code for this uh for a few reasons um and i think i think if you are not familiar if you don't have a favorite text editor of choice already i think you should follow along with that just so you can uh, follow along with everything that i'm doing um and because we'll get some syntax highlighting and i think when you're first learning how to code i think syntax highlighting is very important um so that you can, your, your brain kind of makes some connections, or at least I found that your brain makes connections uh, between those colors and what things mean. Um, and so it, it, it's, it's an aid in helping you really understand. So if you can, if you can get Visual Studio Code installed um, on your computer um, or another text editor, uh, when we go through that, uh, please try to go ahead and do that. But if not, you can hop straight into here. So no big deal either way. All right, let's present again. And actually, let me share that. Um, people can click on that. HTTPS uh, play.golang.org. Cool. Yep, you should be able to go there. All good. Next one. So let's get cracking. Let's let's start immediately. Let's get Golang installed. Let's get a text editor installed. So I added a few um, commands here. Um, so I'll share. Uh, let's go back. I'll share this. Um, this is the this is the link to the Go installation package. Um, but in the in the chat, if you if you're running a Mac and you want to install GoLang, type in exclamation point Go Mac. Uh, if you're running Windows, exclamation Go Windows. And if you're doing Linux, exclamation Go Linux. Um, both Mac and Windows have a simple executable package. Um, so does Linux. Uh, actually, Linux doesn't for GoLang. Um, but basically, you'll go to the to this page. Um, it will download something for you. Um, and you should just be able to click through it on both Mac and Windows. Now, Linux is a little bit differently. It works a little bit different. So um, in, in the Linux command that um, that you'll get back from the chat, I've given you two installation options for Debian-based distributions, um, one, one for Debian-based distributions and one for Red Hat-based distributions. Um, where am I entering that to on Windows? So one second, let me, hold on. let's do HTTPS. Um, I'm gonna go to this site. Um, slash doc slash install. So yeah, so if you go to this page and actually let's do that right now. Go to here. It's gonna take you to a page that looks like this. 
again if you are on um if you are on mac or windows you can you can type in um download go click here to take you to the downloads page and then so they have some installers here so here's the one for windows it it installs a simple executable go ahead and download it click on it it'll run through it's a normal package installation so if you ever installed anything like google chrome you can just click through and that will work um, I think the Mac option gives you some kind of PKG file, or you can use Brew to install it. Um, you can use Brew to install uh, everything for uh, for Apple OS if you don't want to use this PKG. And then again, for Linux, you can yum install uh, if you're on Fedora or Red Hat or CentOS, or you can um, or you can app get install. And so I'll show you. So I'm running a Debian based distribution here. I'm running uh, Pop OS, which is a based off of Ubuntu, and I can just do a sudo apt-get install golang. Um, but I already have it installed, so um, so yeah, it's gonna give me some other stuff. I installed it a different way. I'm not gonna install it right now um, because I already have it installed. So I'll give people a little bit of time to do that. Um, number one African, the um, you should definitely use, yeah, you should definitely use Homebrew if you have Homebrew installed. I'm pretty sure it's just brew install golang. For that uh, but the scope of this boot camp it's pretty wide um you can head to academy.mastermind.io that'll give you the full um curriculum curriculums is off to the left um and you can check out what the full scope is we're gonna go pretty in depth on a lot of devops tools we're not gonna go crazy deep into programming i can't teach you how to program in two weeks or a week or two um but i can give you the, the tools so that when we start programming a little more you can really understand the concepts and what we're doing and it'll make a lot of sense um but yeah, I'll give people time to, to try to get through that. Um, ask questions um, if, if you're having trouble. We'll try to get it resolved. But um, again, don't sweat it if you can't get it installed right now. That'll be part of your homework if you can't get it installed. And you can use the Go Playground to kind of go through what we want to do. Yeah, I didn't want to throw Brew out there. I don't want to throw Homebrew out there because I assumed that most people had Homebrew installed until I tried to teach people how to do something else, um, get something else installed um, another time. and. I realized that I had to figure out how to get Brew installed and that requires Ruby and some other stuff. But Homebrew is a package manager inside of um, inside of Mac. Think about it kind of like the, the just the Apple App Store. Um, and it's just a package manager where you can just uh, easily grab applications from the command line. But cool, we'll give, I'll, you know, take two or three minutes, try to get it installed. For people who are running Linux, I'm assuming if you're already running Linux, then you probably understand how to untar files maybe um or or install things from source um you could absolutely do snap i didn't even think about snap um what what does snap run on besides does it only run on linux um i believe i believe golang's in here yeah if you like snap you could absolutely oh yeah yeah that would have been great I will add that to I'll add that to some tutorials for sure. Thank you for for that. Um, people are using Linux snaps a pretty dope. Um, it'll be, snap will make more sense to you once we get to the Docker section. Um, but snaps a great way to easily install packages. Uh, they, they're easily updatable. Um, they don't actually install directly on your system, but um, it's it's a pretty cool way to easily be able to install applications. Um, can seem to load the site. Did I paste in the right thing? Uh, oh, it's 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 probably redirecting the HTTPS for you. Um, it has to be HTTP um, because I have not put it behind CloudFront yet. I can do that later, but try this HTTP colon slash slash. Yeah, there you go. Um, so you don't, you actually don't, uh, because this, this site is just a static, uh, academy.mastermind.io is just a static website sitting in an S3 bucket. Um, don't need Let's Encrypt for that. Actually can't use Let's Encrypt for that um, because uh, there's no web server sitting out in front of it. I can throw it behind uh, CloudFront. I just haven't quite had the time. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Once I discovered the learn theme, I was like, ah, this is, this is great. Um, but cool, 820, perfect. Yeah, so, um, being, I don't know what that means. Um, 
cool so hopefully you were able to get it installed um yeah hopefully you were able to get it installed so let's let's continue down the line Present. um so actually let's also get vs code installed now sorry so we got we got golang installed now if you don't already have a text editor installed let's go ahead and get visual studio code installed so um i removed visual studio code so you all could see um I guess kind of see how that process is but it's just like any other application visual studio code is a um, you can just google it um, honestly or you can do exclamation point uh, vs code and it will give you the download link uh, visual studio code is an open source text editor made by microsoft um and um it's 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 pretty quick it's pretty fast it's got a lot of tooling around it um it's a pretty it's a pretty great uh tool to be honest i'm I'm not a lover of Microsoft, um, or at least I, I wasn't a lover of Microsoft. They've, they've changed my mind in the past few years, um, but people have really um, so get, given us a chance. And it's, it's from what I can see, it's become kind of the top uh, free editor that you can use. Um, I'm running, again, Debian based, so I'm just gonna click this. Um, it'll, it, will, it will select um, the right package based on your computer. So <clears throat> when you go to this page, if you're running Mac, um, <clears throat> It will probably give you a Mac download. If you're running Windows, it should give you a Windows download. Simply click that package. Um, let's go ahead and down that, download that. Um, <clears throat> so it has a cool executable for Linux. And I'll just go ahead and install that. Yeah, so so Ubuntu, um, we'll talk. We'll talk. Actually, I think Linux is next. So I think starting next Monday, we'll be talking specifically about Linux. I think we have four weeks of Linux. Um, Ubuntu is a distribution of Linux. So just think of it about it like uh, Mac or or Windows. Uh, about uh, Mac OS or Windows, it is another operating system that you can use. Ubuntu is one of the uh, most popular ones that people use for desktop operating systems. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it's pretty common. This one itself is actually Pop OS, which is based off of Ubuntu. Um, there's a pretty, I'll give them a plug here. There's a pretty great company called System76 uh, who makes Pop OS. So they make Linux laptops um, and they actually make drivers and things for the laptops so that they work. Um, it's a pretty cool company. Um, so Pop OS is what you, was what I'm using um, in this VM. We'll definitely go over that during the Linux portion. Um, but just wanted to shout them out a little bit. They're pretty cool. I've, I I do own a laptop from them, uh, which works pretty great. <clears throat> All right, so I've got VS Code um, installed, so I can just you know, open up Visual Studio Code, and I have a pretty cool text editor here. So I've already had some stuff installed before, uh, VS Code installed before, so it looks like it picked up all of my stuff. Um, it's got a lot of stuff here, so cool. Cool. I'll delete. Don't save it. Um, actually, gonna delete. This. I think we did this last time. All right. So, uh, a text editor. All a text editor is is a thing is a program that allows you to edit text. Um, VS Code again is going to be our one from uh, of choice for this, um, but you can use any one that you'd like. Uh, what I do to pay the bills, um, I am, I'm, so I am a DevOps engineer. Um, I'm a technical lead and DevOps engineer for um, a pretty dope company out in Baltimore called Fearless. Everyone should check out the site, it's fearless.tech. It's a pretty great place, um, but that's what I do there. I've, I've, I've been in tech for a little while now, um, and so that's yeah, that's what I do. So I, I just, that's why I'm, I'm kind of running this. I really wanted to <clears throat> kind of show people what DevOps was, um, help people kind of get up to speed. I know how difficult my journey was into uh into devops you know i come from a systems administration background um and like you know trying to figure out what i needed to do to become a devops engineer um and to move into this uh space was uh was a little daunting um especially as it was kind of the new buzzword um so i thought i'd do i I'd, I'd do my best to kind of show others how to get into it but yep that's what i do for my day job um we're almost always hiring um so yes we we, we almost are always hiring uh, we're growing pretty quickly um so yes if you're interested uh reach out to me um reach out to go go find the job on the website reach out to me directly um i would love to get the referral bonus if anyone is interested if anyone from fearless is watching 
that's that's gonna it's gonna have to be okay you're, you're never gonna know um but yeah reach out to me directly um i can I, I can put in your resume um if you like um but it's a pretty great place definitely check out the website cool so we got vs code installed um and then once we get vs code installed the only setup that we have to do if you have golang installed already and you have vs code set up we only have to do one thing um so in visual studio code um let's let's actually talk about the anatomy of visual studio code really quick um so when you open it you'll kind of get this stuff here there's probably something open before uh you might not have this um but what you have here on the side is this little top thing is just your explorer so this is just where you can see your files nothing special here you'll see once we open up some files you will get to see that this is just where it shows your files this uh this is where you can do some searching um so if you need to you know you can imagine that if your code base is really large and you have lots of files and you want to find out where some words are you want to find something specific this tool is the tool that you can use to search and you can do some cool things like find and replace and some other things there so pretty great tool Git, um, Git. We'll talk about Git next class. Actually, Git is a version control uh, software. Ignore that for this class. Um, we'll talk heavily about that next time. Um, debugging. This helps you find. Uh, this helps you solve issues with your code um, in a pretty cool way. We we won't do anything with the debugger during this, um, but that's what that's there for. And the last one is extensions. So this thing is pretty cool. Um, all you got to do to install ins extensions inside of uh, VS Code is just type them in here. So you type in go, some packages will come up. Go ahead and click the very first one and click install. Um, this will install all of the auto completion and all the cool colors and stuff that you want for Golang. Um, yeah, it'll install all that stuff in there um, and get you ready. So after you do that, it may give you um, whenever we actually open up a, a piece of like a go file it may give you it may say hey you're missing some things uh, if you do see that uh, just go ahead and click the install button it'll do everything for you in the background don't sweat it um, even if you don't install the install the go extension it should still do some syntax highlighting for you um, but all you got to do is just type in go here and just install the, the very first one uh, which will give you that language support so we'll take some time uh, let people kind of get that installed ready to be confused um that's that's good um uh, are you going to teach the same linux materials you did in the crucible youtube so um i will it'll there'll definitely be some overlap there we're going much more in depth um in linux uh during this during this uh four core session uh, for linux uh we're gonna be we're gonna be doing a lot more hands-on stuff as well like most of this most of this is gonna be pretty hands-on um from here on out um yeah, almost, almost everything's gonna be pretty hands-on. I'm gonna start providing you guys with some files and things um, so that you can skip some of the uh, some of the boilerplate stuff um, so that it'll be a little bit easier. But that none of that will be um, done until after we go over Git next class um, so that, cause that's where the stuff will live. Um, and I'll teach you guys how to grab those things out of there uh, so that we can do that. But I'm very glad, Sam, that you said you're ready to be confused. So we talked about it first, first, uh, first class. It is okay to be confused. Uh, part of this this entire bootcamp is for you to get comfortable with being confused, comfortable with not really knowing. Um, it's okay to run through this and and do your best to pick it up. And even if it doesn't make any sense or very, or you think it makes very little sense to you, don't sweat it. You'll have to put in some more work later. And next time you take a look at it, um, it'll make sense just that much faster. Um, and and it may take it may take me saying or doing a certain thing or for you to see um, see a passage or something or or to read something for everything to kind of click and trigger and fall into place. So it's okay. It's one hundred percent okay to be confused. Um, <clears throat> it takes <clears throat> takes some people forever to understand how to code. It takes. Some people, some people get it like that. Some people understand that logic and understand it just like that. Most people take, it takes a while. So, you know, we're doing a week of coding here, um, but this is just to give you the tools uh, to really understand the tools that you have available to you rather than for you to get great at uh, programming. Um, <clears throat> and again, after this, after this week, pick up these tools. But if you wanna uh, hop into a different language, I absolutely encourage it. Um, Python will probably be the one that I would recommend. Um, you can keep going with Golang if you like, if you have a good handle on it, um, it'll make it easier for you to pick up another language a little bit later. Um, Emacs, real programs use butterflies. So I am a Vim, I am a Vim person. I, I would I would prefer to use Vim right now, but um, I think that would be confusing for you all. Um, 
just because of how naturally, uh, you know, people go through their, um, their keyboard commands and shortcuts and a lot will be happening without um, a lot of instruction. Um, Vim is pretty, pretty confusing to use actually. Um, so cool. So what time is it? 8.30, perfect. We're, we're right on time. Um, so once you get, once you get this installed, uh, Chris on Twitch, thank you so much for the subscription. Um, once you get VS Code installed, once you get the Go package installed, um, what you can do to check if Golang is installed properly. So if you are on Windows, you can op you, uh, hit the Windows key and open up a command prompt, um, it, or you can open up PowerShell, your choice. Um, if you are on Mac, open up a terminal. Um, and if you are on Linux, open up a terminal. And all you have to do to check if it is working properly is type in Go. If you type in Go and you get some output like this that says Go is a tool for managing Go source code, um, with some of the stuff like right here, it um, it is working. Um, or if you just type in Go version, if you don't want all this output, it'll give you the version of Go that you're using. So this is actually an older version of Go. Um, and I probably should install this from the site. Um, I don't I don't know why it's such an old version, but um, cool. Yeah, yeah, once you hopefully if you if you see that you're all good to go. Everything we do tonight is going to be uh, nice and easy for you. If uh, you're having some trouble, if that doesn't, um, if when you type in Go version and you think you have it installed, if nothing happens, um, there may be some playing around. We have to do with it later. Um, don't sweat that right now. Reach out, uh, join the Slack channel. Reach out on the Slack channel. We'll get it all resolved for you. Even if we've got to go through and do a you know a screen sharing session. But um, yeah. Uh, so if you want to deal with ads, if you want to deal with ads that uh that won't be blocked with the ad block, if you're talking about specifically for the stream, you can subscribe. Um, you, and you will not see any ads. So if you, especially if you have um Amazon Prime, you can subscribe to the channel, and you won't see those ads anymore. I'm not in control of those ads. Um, yeah, I'm not in control of those ads. But yeah, if someone has something cool, um, that can block them absolutely. Um. Cool, so now we have Go installed. Now we have VS Code installed. We have the Golang package. We are ready to start putting the tools in the tool chest. Uh, we're, we're really ready to start learning how to program. So let's head back over to this. Cool, so again, focus on the concepts. I've said it 30 times. I'll say it every single course. Focus on the concepts here. The concepts are what's, are what's important. You can transfer this to any uh, tool, any piece of technology, any uh, programming language, focus on the concepts. I'm gonna talk heavily about the concepts rather than the syntax. Don't sweat the syntax at all. Worry about that concept. Uh, it's very hard to memorize syntax. It, you'll get it in time, but focus on the concepts. All right, what is the first thing that you probably want to do when uh, when coding? Um, this is this is definitely one of the most important things that you can do, um, and this is the the very first program that anyone ever writes. Uh, we are going to be displaying output. So um, and you can see here we've got a little uh, Arduino or whatever that says "I love bacon," um, but there's some code on here that that makes it say "I love bacon." And how are we going to do that? So to 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 display uh, output, we're gonna print it. Um, so in a, a lot of languages, the the way you print is just print. There's a lot of different keywords for this. There's a lot of different functions that allow you to print things out to the console, and the console being the the uh, the terminal in which we're gonna be modifying these things in. But you're gonna print it out, um, and so we're gonna use some tools built into Go to allow us to print some things out. So this part right here is so printing um, output to it to to the screen, to the console, is a concept that, that is across the board in any language, and we'll write it in a few languages here. Um, but this piece is what is Go specific. So in Go, the thing that allows you to print out uh, things to the console is the FUMPT package. That is how people pronounce it in the Go community. Uh, I think I think it's the format package, could be completely wrong, but it's the FUMPT package, and it includes the necessary tools to be able to print things out to the console. And so you've got some options here. So we're gonna go really quick over format.print, format.printline, and format.printf, and we're gonna talk about the differences here. All right, so this is this we're, we're we're getting into it. This is the first bit here, and you're gonna you're gonna see when we talk about the differences between these three. Um, like this is the very basics, but this is how it starts to get a little bit confused. Um, so what we'll do here is I don't have VS Code open. 
gonna quit VS Code. I'm gonna go ignore what I'm doing here. You'll know what this is in the next couple weeks. Um, stream code. I don't want to do that. Actually, I'm gonna delete all this stuff. All right, so we're gonna make a directory and I'm gonna call it um, go part one. All right, so in here, I'm gonna make a file. Actually, I'm gonna open up VS Code right here. All right, so we got a directory here, get a little uh, welcome thing from VS Code. We're gonna create a new file. So if you wanna create a new file in VS Code, um, go oh, make sure you're selected the Explorer uh, icon here and then make sure you're in the right directory that you wanna be in, or even if you're not, um, but you can still create a file. And you just click new file. So very simple to create a new file here. Um, and then in this, we're gonna create a file. I'm gonna call, you can call it whatever you like. It just needs to end in the .go extension. So I'm gonna call this, um, I'm gonna call it print.go so we can put some examples here. Awesome, so now we have our go, um, our go file. So you can see how great text editors are. It automatically knows since I put in the .go here, that is a go package and it puts the little go logo here, the go icon. Um, and then we have print.go here. So I think there's a way to like put in the, um, the boilerplate code for go. Um, and so this is gonna be, um, this is gonna be the worst part, but what you can do is you can go over to um, the go playground and you can copy and paste this if you'd like, um, or you can type it in, um, but you can go copy and paste it and I will show you exactly what you need. This is the code that you need to run any Go package. So we, we'll talk a little bit about this, but um, just know that you need to copy in, uh, like you need to have this, this set up. Um, and, but all you need to really worry about is the stuff inside of here. So we're gonna basically write our code inside of here. Um, in this in this main function um, down here. Don't worry about what a function is, but you need you need this little boilerplate code. So again, go over to the Go Playground, copy and paste it, and remove the line here. And so actually, you can leave that line. We can we can actually take everything that's in the Go Playground. So if you if you're on the Go Playground, leave it as it is. It's perfect. Um, so the first program that people usually write is a Hello World program. Um, and so that's just a program that takes. Um, that takes some text, hello world, or, or whatever the text you'd like, um, and it prints it out to the screen. So um, to save something in here, you're just gonna do um, a control save, um, control, uh, actually control S will save that for you. Um, and so now we have a file that is saved. Um, so we, we took, again, we took this exactly from the Go Playground and you saw in the Go Playground, if we ran this, it just spit it out here. So that's how, that's that's our first program. Again, don't worry about the funk stuff. We're only worried about this line of code here. Um, and you can see here to, to be able to run it. So we talked about Go being a compiled language. It is a compiled language, but it's built also in a way that you can, um, that you can run this, uh, and it, it kind of compiles it for you and runs it kind of real time so that it acts like an interpreted language. And there's a there's a command for that. I'm gonna show it to you in a second. But you can do this in two ways. So so you may be wondering how to run a Go application. The way you run a Go application is to, um, you've gotta go to a, if you don't compile it, you have to go to um, a terminal. We can do that inside of VS Code. So we actually never have to leave VS Code. If you hit control, um, tilde, so control like the in the key under escape, go with a little squiggly line that also has the back tick on it. Um, it will open up a console for you, um, or you can go back to the console you you were in before. Uh, how do I make notes next to my code? Okay, cool. So, oh, that's a great question. If you want to make notes next to your code, um, commenting in GoLang. Um, so, if you don't. This is a cool uh, VS Code trick. If you don't know what the commenting, uh, how to comment in a certain language, if you hit Control, um, uh, what's it, forward slash, it will automatically comment for you. So you can see how um, it added in two two double slashes there. Uh, if you hit Control slash, it will insert the proper uh, thing for you. Um, but that is how you comment next to your code. So if you wanted to just comment um, next to your code like this is how you print something. You could do that if that's a reasonable way for you to uh, to keep notes. That's a, that's actually a great question. Um, so it's just double slash. That is how you comment inside of Golang. 
yeah no semicolons nice right um cool so to be able to run this um so i actually encourage you to use the the terminal here so i think you can actually just hit terminal right here uh i think you hit terminal oh and go to new terminal and it will open up a terminal for you but i encourage you to stay inside of this um but yeah so i can see here that um my files here you don't need to do that you can just do go run and then the name of your file so i call my file print.go whatever you decided to call your file if you type in go run and then the name of your file it will run that code it, it'll compile it and it'll it'll interpret what uh the output um cool so you can see it's, it's hello Play, playground and it says hello playground here so that is that's us learning how to print things out display output we could change this to whatever we want you can say hello my name is aaron save just save it run run the same thing again and now you can see that the text has changed um to exactly what we want so very simple um this is a very simple thing it's something you're gonna have to do very often so understanding how to output things to the screen is 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 key but now let's get a little more complicated so we talked about three different things here we talked about print uh print line and print f let's go over what the difference between those are so uh run shortcut what do you mean by run shortcut you're saying is there a is there a shortcut to be able to run your code if there is i don't know what it is um you may be able to set up um i don't know why this is acting so weird inside of my uh vm but uh run powershell it's f5 um yeah maybe yeah try that out try f5 I, i'm not sure um the best way to run it is to do go run the name of the file but we saw the three different things here so we did print line print f so just print put my dot print and let's go ahead and run this again cool so now we can see it's it's the same it did what we wanted to do but something's different here uh, something's a little different between these two um it printed everything out and then it put my new stuff right next to the code um wh why would it have done that um so we can actually see we ran print it gave me that and let's run print line again and run it again and it looks like it moved it down to the next line all right this is because of something called a new line character. So when you hit enter on your keyboard, um, what actually happens is uh, it actually imp like it actually passes along characters to your computer. Your computer does not display them, but at the end of each of these lines, there, um, whenever you hit a new line, so if I want to go underneath here, it is putting in a character to represent that. That character is backslash n for new line. Um, so what happens when you run the difference between print line? So the difference between this piece of code and print is I run this, it'll print it'll print out both things. So the first time it runs, it enters it automatically at the end of this line, it enters in that slash in. So it enters a new line character and then it tries to print this. But if you just do print, it does not give you a new line at the end, um, which is very interesting. So, um, but I'll show you something cool. I can actually add that character into the print statement and you can see how it changed colors. Um, and that's VS Code knowing um, how to interpret this information. If you if you see if I run it like this, it adds two new lines. So um, this line right here is the exact same thing as the line above it. Um, so. Again, this is, this is actually a great concept to show that um, there's no right, there are best practices, there are there are things you should try to do because they're good for, uh, they're good for developers, um, they're good paradigms, but there are, there's like a million ways to do things in programming. It's, there's no one right way at all. You can do things in so many different ways. Um, so whichever you feel comfortable with, um, works for you. Um, I thought the new line character thing was cool, just to show you that there are similar things, similar functions that uh, that do different things. Um, yeah, that print line just creates a new line for you. So let me let me get some questions because I know that can be a little complicated first. No new line character, cool. So you got that. Um, when would you use print? Uh, great question. Um, I'm I'm actually not sure. I I always default to print line. Uh, I don't know any. I can't think of any great situations off the top of my head where print will be more valuable uh, than print line. 
yeah i i don't know any offhand print lines are usually what you want to do maybe you'd use print if you wanted to um i don't know maybe if i wanted to have like if i want to do print hello my name is aaron and maybe if i wanted to say like i don't know why you would want to do this but like and i am 29 years old that's my real age by the way um but if I run that, it puts it all in the same line. So maybe, maybe you would want to do that. Um, I, I don't know why you would do that. There's better ways to do that. Um, but yeah, some situations may require it. Um, bugger. Yeah, we, I think I'm going to do so. So I'm doing this. I'm, I'm doing this boot camp, but there will be supplementary streams along the way. Um, I may do an entire stream on debugging. Um, on, on debuggers because they're pretty powerful um but they're yeah the setup's a little interesting if you've never done it before i'm actually just recently learned how to use debugger well um so maybe i maybe that's something we can go over um that i need to understand the concept yep invisible new line character yes that's true so um you know this invisible like so in if this is print line um it's throwing in an it's, it, this is in that this is in that statement, but it's it's invisible, um, and that could cause issues. Absolutely, um, and so knowing knowing how to kind of get around that and being able to to use different things and different tools to solve your problem um, is really good to know. So we've got two things here. We've got print line, print ln. We've got print, and then the last one was print f. So let's let's copy this. Actually, delete this and let's. Let's do it three different times. And let's change, we'll just change the first one. We'll make the last one the print, since there's no new line. Let's change this, let's leave this at print line. And then let's talk about print F. Print F is my favorite. Um, it's a very interesting one. This one is gonna, this is gonna mess with you. Uh, oh, great. So you saw that, I told you that I was 29. That means I am a millennial. I mean, I'm a 90s baby, I was born in 90. Uh, the three things you're seeing right here are the three starter Pokemon. Pokemon was like kind of my life when I was a kid. Very nostalgic for me. Um, these are this Charmander, uh, this is Squirtle, this is Bulbasaur. Um, so if you're not familiar with who those, uh, what those things are, you should definitely go out and check out, uh, learn, learn yourself something about Pokemon. Pokemon is the best. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, Digimon, I, I, Digimon was trying to take over Pokemon and kind of, you know, it was cool, but like, you know, I, I, I had too much, I had too much, uh, I was too ingrained in Pokemon. So I kind of hated Digimon for no reason It's honestly, it's, I mean, it's bad. It's, it's, you know, it's a good show, but, uh, I hated it because I had to, um, but cool. So now we've got print F, um, and let's see what happens when we run this code. So we know this first line is going to print out. Hello, my name is Aaron. And we know that because it's print line that at the end, it's going to insert a new line character. So it's going to drop us down to the next line. Now we don't know what printf is going to do, um, but we're going to assume it's going to say, hello, my name is Aaron also. And then the last line is going to print this without a new line. So it's going to say, hello, my name is Aaron, but it's not going to enter in a new line. So we should see three, um, hello, my name is Aaron. So I'm going to do a clear here. And we're gonna run this again. So go run print.go. All right. So we see here, hello, my name is Aaron once. Looks like we have hello, my name is Aaron again, and it does not have a new line after it. Um, so print F, we can see does not throw in a new line. And then the last one, we see hello, my name is Aaron. So it did what it was supposed to do. It displayed us three hello, my name is Aaron's. Maybe I should have put one, two, three in there so it was a little easier to see. But now we can confirm. There's no new line in this print F and there's no new line in print. What print F does for you is print F does formatting. So this is actually gonna be kind of weird to show you because we haven't yet gone over variables, which we we're about to, but we can do cool things like this. So I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna comment out this line and I'm gonna comment out this line. So we can do cool things like this. Um, Print F allows you to format, um, to format your output, uh, to format, yeah, to format your string, to format your output um, in, in a, a variety of different ways. Um, so I'm gonna create a quick variable where we're about to learn about variables in like right after this. Um, so I'm gonna say name, 
and I'm gonna set it equal to Aaron. And then, and then in uh, in printf, I can do um, I can do something like uh, percent v. And this part is very confusing. The first time I saw this, I was like really confused. So don't, this absolutely, printf is absolutely something you have to check out. I'll show you where the documentation is. Um, and I'll show you some some cool videos and examples on it. Um, but cool. So it'll be something like this. So I said my, right here, I set my name equal to Aaron. Um, and then I wanted to, let's just do, hello, my name is Tim V. So let's clear this. And if we run this, it still prints out, hello, my name is Aaron. So we'll learn about variables, but it replaced the value of this down here. Um, and the present V um, allowed us to kind of specify, um, present V is kind of a catch-all that kind of like uh, picks the type that it thinks it is or that it should be and displays it accordingly. Um, we can do some other cool things like, um, we can get the type of something. So let's say I let's say we're doing some debugging and we're gonna go over types shortly. Um, but if I didn't know the type of Aaron and I wanted to see what the type of name was, if I ran this again, it would it, you know it spits out string for me. But it, I can get different sets of information. I can format I can format the print statement um, in in some specific, some specific ways. So if I had more variables, I could do like percent. I could do like a bunch of percent percent signs there's there's things that spit out decimals there's things that spin out integers which are numbers um there's things that spin out strings um and there's different designations it's really complicated um but i want you to just understand again i don't need you to know how to use printf i just want you to understand um that this allows you to format um in in a lot of different ways to dynamically format uh the way we're spitting things out to the screen but um I'll, I can go over that documentation, but I could, I could string them together. And if I had more uh, things, I could just add in like name two, name three, and it would kind of fill in, it would kind of fill in those blanks for me and format them accordingly. Um, so that's the difference between three different print statements. Uh, they, they all, um, they all get text out to the screen. Um, cool, they all get stuff out there. Um, and so let's actually give this a new line. Um, and let's uncomment these. Um, and so now we should see three, my, hello, my name is Aaron's in a row. So hello, my name is Aaron. Hello, my name is Aaron. Hello, my name is Aaron. So three different ways that we can print some things out to the screen. But that's essentially how you want to display output. Um, that's how you get stuff out to the screen. That's, that's, that is, we'll be doing that a lot throughout this process and that is how you do it. So let me, have any questions? Yes, I do mean type because it is a strictly typed language. Um, we will, we're gonna get real deep into that. Um, yep, focus on the concept and we can't use variables um, in the other prints. So um, I, that's a great question. I actually don't know if you can. I don't, you, I think you can. I think you can use variables in here, um, but you can't use the dynamic, um, features that the formatter has for you, that the printf has for you. I think you can use, uh, I'm, I'm like, I'm pretty confident you can use, uh, um, I think you would have to do something like, I don't remember. There's, there's, a, there's a way there's a way to do it, I believe. Um, but you probably wanna use printf for it, um, but you definitely can. We can we can look that up later. Um, oh yeah, or in, yeah, interpolate. So maybe I can do, what can I do like pluses? Um, name plus. Let's do like an exclamation point. Maybe this will work. That's a that was a great question. Um, yeah, I think I can do something like this. Um, yep, and it'll it'll do that. Um, so yes, you can use variables in the other print statements. You just don't have access to those cool dynamic things that uh, that the print allows you to do. Um, I'm getting this error while using this unexpected package um, in the file. That probably means. What, what, if your package is not, um, there's a few things that could be wrong. Make sure your package actually needs to be main. It has to be main. It might've tried to make it something else. Um, yeah, and then and try saving it and maybe it should solve it. Um, cool. 
So cool, we, we've, we've solved that problem. We know how to print things out. So printing a receipt, we could, we could print a receipt if we needed to now. Um, even if we had to write it line by line, we could do this. How do you clear the terminal? Um, to clear the terminal, you either hit Control K, or is it L? It's either Control K or Control L, or you type in the word clear and hit enter and it will clear the terminal. Yeah, sorry, Control L, yep, never Control L. I'm, I'm tripping, all right, cool. Next one, variables. This is like, variables is like, so we learned how to print, that was great, that's really important. Variables is like the, like this is this is like the thing you have to know. Um, it's a pretty simple concept, um, very simple concept actually, um, but being able to work with variables, variables is very, very important. So variables, what are variables? Uh, the word variable means uh, something that can change, it's something that, that, that can change. So um, I thought this was a good image of it. I, I, I Googled it trying to find a good GIF or image to show variables. And it, um, essentially you could think about it like a container. So this, this, this box here, that box would be the variable. Um, and it, it, you know, the, we just actually did this. We set a variable of, uh, of name, um, which is basically a box that kind of holds it's, it's a space to kind of hold some information, information that may change. Um, and then we're gonna set the value of that variable to, maybe we'll start out with it being Maria. Um, and then maybe, uh, you know, maybe Maria gets married and now she has a longer name. So now we can change the value of name um, from Maria to, you know, my last name is Brooks, Maria Brooks. Um, you could you could do something like that. So you can you can change the value of a variable, but it's kind of a, a holder or representation of a value. And so there's a pretty easy way for us to see that. So let's, you can, um, you can either work within the same file. I'm gonna create a new file here, just so we're talking about different concepts in different files. And go, you can go ahead and copy back in that code from the, uh, the go playground, but I'm gonna type it in here um, because I know it so well. Um, you actually don't need this import statement um, if you're not printing, but we're gonna print here too. So we're gonna input format and it will fill in a lot of this stuff for you. Cool, so now we've got our boilerplate back in. Um, and you can take a look and that out for a second. But you saw me do, there are a few ways to kind of um, make a variable. So Variables in all languages, um, two things have to happen. Um, first, you've got to um, instantiate that variable. First, you've got to declare that, like declare that variable. So you have to tell the the programming language or the computer that hey, I'm setting up this this container for a value. So um, so normally a lot of languages you do something like var and the name the name of the placeholder. So I want the 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 name like this this word name. I want it to represent something, and so. First, you have to set it up. So, so in Golang, um, you have to be strict about types. Um, and I should have put types before this. Now that I'm thinking, but um, cool. So you in Golang, you've got to give it. If if you do it this way, um, you actually you have to give it a type. So I'm saying that I want a variable uh, called name, and so I, I want I want this name to hold a string. Um, a string just being a a list of characters. So essentially, think of words and sentences. That is what a string is. Um, and this this right now would now create a space. It will create a space in, in memory, create a space in the program for this uh, for this name variable. And so that's the first thing that has to happen. The second thing that has to happen is I have to assign it a value. Um, so we said name is equal to Aaron. And just like that, we've uh, we've we've set up a variable and we've given it a value. But this value this value could be anything. I could also change it to. You know, later in the program, I could change my name to uh, maybe I like my brother's name is Elijah. Maybe now the name is Elijah, and then maybe later on the name equals Ashley, which is my wife's name. Cool. So it can change throughout the program. I'm going to show you in, in in a little bit using using the print. We're gonna we're gonna use the print stuff that we just learned to confirm that this thing is changing. Um, but we'll, we'll we'll do that in a second. Um, I just want to show you like this is kind of the. The concept, all programming languages have to do both of these things, but in almost all programming languages, you can combine this into a single statement. So this is the same as, and it's gonna show me an error because I've already done it. Um, there are a few ways to do this in Golang. Um, now you can do, you didn't used to be able to do this, I don't think, um, when I first started messing with Golang. This is a newer thing. I can say var name equals Aaron. This is another way I can declare it. Um, so this is all, put 
uh, option one. So you can see the difference. This is option two. And this is option three. Option three, it is a shorthand way to do this. And that's how I did it the first time. And it's Aaron. So all of these three things do the exact same thing. So I can set up a variable any way that I want. Um, most of the time you probably use this. I, I, I don't know, I, I never use this one. This one is it like this way is important sometimes when, um, because this is a strictly typed language, um, even though um, it doesn't do, even though it doesn't try to infer, oh, it does try to infer your type here, but in case there's like, in case you need something to be a different type, we'll, we'll, we're, once we go over types, this is gonna make more sense. But if you need something to be a very specific type, um, you may want to do it this way um, so that, um, you get the, the proper output that you want. And that again, that'll make more sense shortly. Um, so all these would do the same thing. We'll go with, um, oddly enough, I think for for display purposes um, and for like, I, I think it's important for you to see that bar keyword. Cause like in other languages, you're gonna have to do something like this bar or let or something like that. So I think we're gonna use that for all of our examples here, just because that var will kind of prompt your mind that this is a variable and that is what's important. Variable is what's important. And then this thing can change. Now, um, so let's prove that this can change. So um, let's do a format print line and let's print the value. Let's print the value of the name variable. Um, what happened here? Name. Oh, wow. Here we go. Um, unclear, we're we'll using this block. Standard naming convention like camel case uh, or Pascal case. Um, um, there are, I mean, it kind of depends on like if you're working with a team, they'll kind of decide that. Um, I think, I don't think, uh, so I, th I think Golang, um, I don't think you can have a capital, I don't think you can have a capital, um, I do not think you can have a capital name for a variable. Like I think if I tried to do, um, oh yeah, thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's supposed to import for me. Did I save it? Uh, it's supposed to do the import for me. Um, that's cool. Thank you for the import. Um, there's another reason why. Um, oh, actually, I think I do know the reason why. I think the reason why is because I'm using an older version of Golang. I'm using 1.10. While I was messing around with this the other day, this option two is the way that I didn't think it would work. Um, I wonder... Okay, that, yeah, so I didn't think any of that would work. Let me just see something really quick. Um, I don't know, this is definitely another problem. Uh, you put it there in the beginning, and you leave. Wait, what's that? Oh, format. That's why, okay, that was dumb. Um, that is why. It, um, main, you know, it's my previous declaration. Oh, okay. Also, also it's throwing an error because of this other file that's in here. Um, you can ignore that as well. Um, yes. Yeah, so it keeps removing the import for you. The P in format dot print line has to be capitalized. Um, so go is cool because it has a formatter built into it. And so you can see if you go here, um, yeah, go has a formatter built into it. So if you're not using something, um, it will, it will, it will remove that import because you're not using it. Um, or, if you have it in there, it will add it um, so that you can use it. Um, so if, yeah, like if I made this a capital P because it doesn't exist, I click format, it should remove that. It does that in VS Code, um, but you gotta, it's it's annoying. You gotta be pretty strict about what you do. So I typed it properly, um, ignore this. It's cause I have another file in here. That's a, it's a Golang specific problem. But if I run go run uh, variables.go this time, so we were doing print.go the first time, we are doing, um, variables I go this time um, and it, it prints my name out here um, again if you sorry if you save if you save the file and it's removing the format that means you didn't use the format properly so make sure you're you're writing it exactly like this um, and it should keep it there or it should add it um, but cool you can see now that it prints out my name so we know that the value of this variable we know that there is a variable that exists now um, it's a type string and it, it it prints it prints that out um perfect glad you got that fixed um but it prints out my name 
Um, so now what you can do is after you've already declared a variable, so let's actually put this back in place. Just so you know, it's a variable for, make sure this still runs. Cool, so this does work um, in here. Um, now let's change my name. So right here, we've, we've set up that we've declared the variable. We don't need to declare it again. We actually can't declare it again. It's already in the system. It's, it's already there. But to change the value, we can just assign it another value. So now what did I say? My brother's name, which is Elijah. And let's go ahead and print that again. So we print a name up here then we changed it. And then we're gonna print it again. And when we run that, we can see uh, the value of name changes. We printed out the same thing twice. Um, but we were able to change the value that's inside of there. So you could see how that will be, um, how variables will be great for something like, let's say you're keeping, um, maybe you're writing a scoreboard application for football and um, you know you need to keep track of someone's score. So when they score a touchdown, you gotta give it six points. Maybe you have a variable called score and when someone scores a touchdown, you add six to it. When someone scores a field goal, you add three to it. Um, so by the end of the game, you, you, you've got this one thing that's tracking the value um, of this score, and then you could just print out score uh, right at the end. Um, so variables are great uh, for that reason. Again, they they can be changed inside of GoLang. They cannot be. Um, I think in other languages you can, but in, in statically typed languages, once I set this up as a string, so set up as a string here, I cannot change this to any other type. So if I try to change this to like the number five, so integer, this is not a string. It won't even. It tells you immediately uh, that there's a problem. And if I try to run it. It will fail because it has to remain the same type. So even though you can change the value of it, it has to be the same type. So I can make this a string. And so this is why the colors matter. You can see that this is purple and this is yellow. They are two different things as far as Golang is concerned. Um, but if I put quotes around it to make it a string, they're the same thing. And now it's equal to five. So that'll make more sense too for you a little bit later. Um, but essentially, this is variables. Again, they could change. I can change it as many times as I'd like to change it. It is just a placeholder. It is a container for a value. Um, cool. So that's a that's a big one. That's a huge concept to understand. Understanding how to display output. Understanding variables is key. Major key. Understand. Do your best to understand variables. If you, if you didn't quite follow that, um, watch a YouTube video on it. Like uh, like uh, tons of people um, explain this in a great way. Um, but variables is a pretty cool thing. So practice. Um, you can also practice just practice making a few variables. So make a bunch of different variables. So I made one called Aaron. Maybe I want to make a new one called uh, Bar uh, Last Name, and I want to set that equal to my last name, which is Brooks, and I want to print out last name so as you can see here is I have I set up one variable and then I printed out that variable and then I set up a new variable called last name and then I'm gonna print out last name and you can see here it printed that out just fine so you can have as many variables as you want um, and you know you can assign them to whatever values you want and you can move those things around um, accordingly what's next on the list data types this is the this is the confusing one um, this is probably where you're gonna be the most lost, um, to be honest with you. Um, and this this slide itself is just complicated. Um, I was gonna do it in pieces, uh, but um, but yeah, this this is good. So, cool. <laughs> that's actually pretty cool that you're, that you're, that's clever. Your name's character seven. Um, you're asking what a string is. Um, but we will start with string. Even though bool is up top, string is, uh, type string is just a list of characters. All, it's all a string is. It's a string of characters. So um, if I do var um, name uh, string, um, it has to um, be just a list of individual characters. It could be one character, two characters, three characters, but in, in Golang um, and in most languages, a string is denoted by quotes. So uh, name, equals, you know, Aaron again. These quotes are what make it a string as opposed to a different data type. So whenever you see quotes, think a string. Whenever you see double quotes, think a string. Other languages, single quotes, um, single quotes make a string. Uh, in Golang, double quotes make a string. So in every language, just about, I think every language, quotes make a string. Strings are very important. Strings are just words, strings are characters, strings are sentences. Whenever you're trying to use something like that, when you try to use text, um, a string is likely the type that you're gonna care about. Um, cool, so actually, let's actually make 
to go back, 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 back. Variables, let's save this. I'm gonna push these up to GitHub later and let's go to types.go. We're gonna create a whole new file and we're gonna do package main and we're gonna do import bumped and we're gonna do bunk main. All right, cool. So now we did uh, we did var uh, name is a string, and we did that name equals um, Aaron. And again, quote. So think when you see quotes, um, uh, think string. Awesome. When you see quotes, think string. Um, strings are pretty important. So yeah, when you see quotes, think string. Now let's go to let's because it's up top. Let's go to boolean. Um, bo a boolean value is true false. That's all boolean is. This is something that's in, like this is some this is something that's a part of pretty much all programming languages. You're gonna you're gonna hop into. So a boolean value. So I can say var um, var true false is a bool, um, this is boolean. And that has to be equal to um, true false. We gotta set it equal to the only values that work for boolean are the value true or the value false, your choice. Um, yeah, it's, that, that's all a boolean can be. If it's of type boolean, it will evaluate to either true or either to false. Um, yeah, bool equals true or false. Cool, very, very important, Boolean. So we got strings. Strings is just a list of characters, it's, it's text basically. Um, Boolean values, uh, th that, that data type, that is true or false values. Um, now there's a few um, number types. So, um, so these are all number types that are in Go. Um, yeah, these are all the number types that are in Go. Um, we're, we only care about only worry about um, integer as a data type. So um, let's go var um, num for number, uh, short for number, um, and that's equal to an integer. So you can see here, it gives me a bunch of values. Right now, only worry about int. Um, I'll explain the, the rest to you um, here, but we're gonna set that equal to the number three. And now you can see no quotes around this. The quotes up here, but not down here. If I put quotes around it, it makes it a string. Those are two completely different things. So let's make that an integer. So you just you throw, you pop a number on there. Um, that is now an integer. Integers, um, it's important that you know that integers are whole numbers. So not no decimals, no fractions. Uh, integers are whole numbers. Thinking back to your math classes. Um, yeah, and what else? Uh, they are both positive and negative numbers. Uh, both positive and negative whole numbers. Think back to math class, most people forget it. Um, positive and negative whole numbers. All right, yes, number types do have limits. We're not gonna worry about those right now, but number types do have limits. You won't need to know those. Uh, what the other int types are, so everything that you see here, uh, once you learn a little bit more about bits and bytes and, and um, uh, and all that you'll these will make a little more sense to you. So actually uh, I'm gonna provide a resource I think I provided a resource after the last one um, called the base CS podcast um, This teaches you a lot about basic computer science topics um, But these all have different limits. So um, int 8 I think int 8 it might be um, Might be an alias for n32 I think but these all have different limits So they all start at zero and they oh that, sorry. They don't all start at zero. They all um, they depending on the size of the number, you may have to, depending on how big the number is, you may have to use a higher one of these. So if you're doing some complex things and you, you're getting really large numbers, you may have to specify specifically an N32 or N64 uh, to be able to handle that number. Uh, each of these, as you go up, holds more amount of data, which uh, uh, allows you to hold a bigger number inside of them. Um, not important in some other languages, important here. Um, it's more important that you just know what integer is. Um, and so let's finish out with the number types. Um, so we did int, some other number. Actually, let's do this. Let's do um, 
These are all number types. Um, in Golang, you also have um, something called, let's do, um, let's do num2 equals uh, a uint. So uint is also a number type, um, but it is an unsigned, it stands for unsigned integer. So this, the top one was an integer. Those could be positive or negative. Unsigned means it does not have a sign to it. So it does not have positive or negative. So it can only be positive. So you it goes from zero to up to whatever number, whatever thousands, whatever hundred thousand. Um, so a you it has to be a positive number. Um, I, I don't think uh, a lot of languages do specifically that, but you know, it could be anything like this. Um, and so the first one could be positive. This just has to be a positive number, positive whole number. All right. Um, and then the last um, number data type that you should really worry about are these two, float 32 and float 64. Uh, so really just a float. So var uh, decimal is a float. So, um, I just told you exactly what it was, but a float um, is decimal. So we talked about these being whole numbers. Floats are decimal. So this is like one dot three, four, five um, or pi or whatever you want it to be. That is what a float is. So those are different. Um, you know, decimal numbers are a different data type <coughs> than integers or uints. Um, they're not the same thing. They can't interact with each other. You can do some math with them, but um, they are different types and it is, it is very important to understand the differences between a float and an integer. They are two different data types. Um, and so these are the these are the main three number types I want you to worry about. So now we've got strings, which are a list of characters, um, text essentially. Uh, we've got uh, Boolean values, which are true false values. Um, pretty simple there. Then we've got a couple of number types. We have integers um, and really you can combine these two. I, I debated not even telling you about uint but integers, um, positive or negative whole numbers, complete numbers. And then we've got floats, which are decimals. Um, and that is all I want you to worry about there for that. Um, hmm, runes, um, well actually complex, complex is also, um, complex 64 and complex 128 for, for, uh, for Golang are also number types and they're made up basically they're, they're kind of based out of some of these floats so they're they're very complex it's for you know very difficult uh, computational thing where you're where you're you have these big giant numbers you know different computations within uh various float like float items kind of put together um so complex numbers you may have to use that don't worry about that um that's not important to us now because again we are working on the concepts we're not trying to learn golang we're just trying to learn what they are uh runes i think are important um runes are uh um, so runes are aliases so we talk about string being a uh talk about string being a list of characters a rune is a single character um so let's go with character what's the best way to do this and call it a rune and then character must be equal to um so you can't make it equal to i don't think i, I don't think i can do this um okay so we'll let me do that so it says in here um that a rune is an alias for an integer that's that might sound weird because i just told you it's, in, it's a character so um it says it's, it's an alias for n32 so um, there's something called an ASCII table. So if, if, uh, if you don't know what ASCII is, ASCII is, um, ASCII is the character code, uh, for, for characters. So when you type an A into your, into your keyboard, um, it sends a code to the computer. Um, and you know, it may do it in a, in a, in a bunch of different ways, but, um, the value for a capital A, um, the decimal number for that is, uh, is 10. Um, but a lowercase a is a lowercase a on this list, um, uh, has a different value. Uh, oh, cause this is capital A over here. I'm um, sorry. Capital A is actually, uh, 65, but a lowercase a is actually 97. Um, that is what this reference is. So when it talks about integers, it's basically pulls the, um, it pulls the value the, the decimal value, um, here for the base 10 value for, 
a rune. So um, I think if I if I print it out, I actually think if I print it out, this rune, um, I think it would give me the. I'm pretty sure it would give me the uh, the number value. Um, and runes may be done with. Actually, I need to comment out all of this stuff because it's gonna say it hasn't been used, but I'm interested to see what happens because let's see what happens. Let's see here. Fine. And this is how you should be messing around with code. Uh, you may not be following right now all the things that I'm doing, um, but once you get into it, you'll start messing around just like this, um, just to kind of see what happens, see what see what things do when you're not sure. Because, um, like, like I said, I've I've messed with Golang for a while, um, but I don't I don't know what this will print out because I don't mess with the runes all that often. Cool. So you can see here how even though I set character to uh, to a letter to a letter value, so I, I set it equal to A, it printed out 97. Um, yeah, print out that 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 um, ASCII number variable. Um, but I think if I made it more than one character, it would fail, um, or it would make it a string. Yeah, I can't even set it to that um, because a rune is a single character, and you can see if I type in a capital A, it is different. The number value is different. It's sixty five instead of ninety seven. Cool. So that's what a rune is. Um, and now I gotta remove all this stuff. And I actually don't think. You ain't can be that big, but whatever. Say, why doesn't, oh, um, two, yes, it can. All right, cool. Um, so we've got strings, we've got runes, we've got booleans, we've got integers, and we've got floats. Those are kind of the five main ones um, that I want you to worry about. Um, I'm not gonna go over bytes um, right now. Um, I think that'll be confusing. Um, those are the five ones that I want you to work, that I want you to worry about for now. Um, there are some more that we're going to add in next class, um, but these are the five I want you to worry about. Understand what a character is I and mean, what a string is. Understand what a string is. It's a list of characters. Um, essentially, it's a list of runes, honestly, um, in, in Golang, but it's a list of characters. It is text. A uh, rune is a single character, and it is the integer value a value for that character. Boolean, true or false value. Uh, now you're getting your number types. Integers, really important. Positive or negative whole numbers. Um, and then floats, um, floats being decimals, um, they, they can be positive or negative as well. Can you shoot us that link for the rune thingy, Bob? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. So here is the ASCII table chart that just shows you the different values for something. So again, A was 65 and just follow it like that. Um, again, that's the number value for any of those characters that have been created. Yes, a rune is the ASCII value of that character, absolutely. Um, cool. Now, what do we have? What time is it? 923, perfect. Um, cool, so we learned about types. Types are pretty important. Um, I did wanna talk about um, zero values for types really quick, because that's important. What happens when you specify something um, and you leave it empty? Um, so we saw print F before. Um, and so this is a really cool printf statement that allows it to format. Basically, it's gonna print out all the stuff here. We, we set a bunch of empty variables here. So we instantiated all of them. We declared them all, but we didn't give them any values. What happens when you don't give something a value? And we're gonna click run here. And so we can see that an empty, uh, a zero state in Golang at least, in every every um, every programming languages, language is gonna have a different value for the empty value. But for Golang, we're an empty integer. And so we know this is an integer because they put in here. So I was the first thing that got printed out. And the value for for an empty, um, for zero, the zero value for an integer is zero. Uh, the zero value for a float is also zero. So, so because those are numbers, the zero value is zero. The zero value for a Boolean is false. So it defaults to false if it's not there, if there's zero values, that's that's really important. Like that's probably the main one that's important across all languages, that the zero value of a Boolean is false. Um, that should be the case in every programming language. The zero value of an empty string um, is just quotes. So nothing inside of the quotes. Um, those are all important. All of these things are important. Um, 
I assume the rune is zero as well because it is an alias for int 32. Um, but yes, and actually, maybe I can do that. Maybe I can do our uh, G uh, is, actually let's do var R or rune. And let's print out, um, R and set V. Let's see what the zero value of a rune is. So let's run. And again, the zero value of a rune is also zero. Um, Oh yeah, GitLab's GitLab's dope. We'll talk about GitLab um, when we talk about GitHub next class. But yeah, you should you should definitely get all logged in. Um, but cool. So now we know zero values. Zero values are something that's not you don't you don't need to. This is not crazy important for you to remember. Just something I wanted to go over that I thought was important to go over. Um, cool. Now we're gonna really quick do math operators. Let me speed up a little bit so we can do one or two problems after this. Um, but math operators. So. We can also do math inside of uh, of, of uh, programming languages. So not only can we kind of print out things and, and make some decisions there, we can we can do some math. So we can add, obviously. So there's addition, um, and so that's with the plus sign. You use a plus sign to add things together. Subtraction minus, obviously, multiplication. Um, is a star that's how you multiply things so this is kind of like the calculator that's on your computer or on your phone um division is a slash this is these three are the ones that you'll probably need to learn uh modulus is it's pretty important so modulus is uh what do you do when you divide um something and you have a remainder so uh you divide um you divide five into 12 um five goes into 12 two times with two left over um modulus this this percent sign it gives you that remainder so if i did five modulus 12 um or 12 minus five um uh it would it would divide basically those numbers and return to me the remainder um so it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting tool um i've never run into a situation where i needed it in real life but there's plenty of times there's gonna be coding challenges where you got to use that for sure um i've never run into a, a place where i had to use it though in real life um, and, we'll, and so we'll go over an example of that um, so that you understand, but it just returns the remainder. Increment and decrement, so by one. So if you ever need to add one to something, if you ever need to add just the value of one to something, um, you can add a plus plus to it, or you can do a minus minus to remove one. So if you have 10, if you do 10 plus plus, it will give you 11. If you do 10 minus minus, it will give you nine. Um, so those are all pretty important. And let's run through those really quick. Let's create a new file. Call it math.go. All right. Um, oh yes, the, yeah. Well, next next class we'll go into loops and stuff. So we'll definitely learn why those increment and decrement features are great. Um, so package main. Actually, let's close this for now. Uh, package main um, import. Boom. Funk main. All right. Um, and what are we doing? We're doing math here. So let's do some simple math. Let's do format.print line. Let's do um, the first one was addition. So let's do one plus three. Uh, so that's going to print out the value of one plus three. And maybe I should have just copied format.print line. And we want to do a subtraction. So let's do five minus three. Let's do um, one, two times three. Let's do five divided by two. Let's do 10 divided by five. Make it, make it nice and even. Um, and then now let's do the mod one. Yeah, that's the best one. Um, not best one, but that's the that's the programming one that like people don't really know about until they kind of get here. Um, and we'll, we'll do twelve. We'll do twelve modulus five, and then um, like I said, we'll do ten plus, and we'll do 
So these are all the math operators that we have. So there's a lot of times where you'll need to calculate things where you'll need to use math to solve some problems. Um, oh, actually, I wonder if this has to be a variable for me to use it. Hmm. Yeah, this might need to be, so let's try something. Um, we're gonna create a variable that's an integer and we're gonna set that to the value 10. What happens if I do num? Uh, can you not just, use, maybe you can't just use uh... Oh, that's weird. Maybe I don't remember how to use this. All right, I'll figure this out in a second. Um, cool, so let, let's, let's do this. Let's print out this and see what we get. Um, and then we'll figure out the decrement and increment thing. Um, go run, uh, what is this? Math.go, um, num declared and not used. Uh, yeah. um, we run it and we get everything we're supposed to. So one plus three is four. Uh, five minus three is two. Two times three is six. Uh, 10 divided by five is two. And then, uh, 12 modulus five. So if you divide tw uh, 12 by five, five goes into it twice. Um, but it also has a remainder of two. So that's what gets returned. So you can see if, even if we go 13, this should now give us three. Um, so we, we can prove that it's giving us the remain remainder and not the, uh, the actual d division amount. Um, yeah, maybe you can't use, maybe you can't use the increment and decrement outside of a loop. Um, I don't know. That's a, that's also a good question. But again, though, just remember these, uh, give you plus one or minus one pretty simple things there. Um, so that's a quick thing with math. I want to I want to go a little bit faster just to hop in. Okay. Yeah. Save me time for expressions to go. Thank you. Um, sure. So now practice, we're talking about practice. So really quick, I want to show you a site called exorcism. Um, we have a lot, actually we have with a little under 30 minutes left. Um, so there's a pretty cool, um, ah, yes, 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 yes. Um, I can't, I can't throw them inside the print line. Um, thank you for that. Actually it came out perfectly in the, uh, your formatting came out perfectly in the, the chat screen, but not in the real chat, which is interesting. But, um, exorcism.io is where we can go to start practicing this stuff. Um, and so if you're, if you're, especially if you're looking for a job, uh, programming, it's good to start doing some programming um, challenges like this. Um, this on exorcism, they start out really easy uh, and they get a little more difficult. Um, but um, this is a good place to do it. So exorcism IO, you can go here and you can just sign up. Um, I think I, I think I have to sign up. I'm pretty sure. Um, GitHub. Am I signed in on GitHub here? I'm not. You can just go and you can sign up cool it has some of the stuff like i was um i was messing around with some of this stuff um before i've i've used this before i actually have i think i have a an account with this stuff is like almost done um but once you get into exorcism.io and so you don't you definitely go here and sign up right now if it's convenient um but um once you get in here um it has these language tracks so you can see how, how you could use any language that you want this it's just about everything that you want um obviously we're gonna use golang um when you click in, it's got all of these, uh, all these options for things for you to do. Um, if you change from, I'm in independent mode right now, but at the bottom, if you go to switch to mentored mode. So the good thing about exorcism.io is it's free, but you can get mentorship. You can get people to review your code, uh, for you for free, no problem. Um, and they'll give you some pretty good feedback on it. Um, so what you do is, um, you download, you basically, they have a command line tool. I'm going to install it really quickly to show you kind of how that, how it works. Don't sweat it right now. If you can't, cause I'm going to move into this kind of fast. Cause we don't have that much time. Um, get the part of the homework is to, you know, get exorcism set up locally on your computer, um, and be able to, um, pull, pull code down from it. So basically what's going to happen is, um, over to the, so if you click on hello world, and you hadn't done it, um, it would give you something. So let's let's go to one that's in progress. Cool. So this is what a challenge will look like um, when it's brand new to you. And I know it's kind of small here, but we want to go through this begin walkthrough over here on the right. And this will show us how to get the uh, command line tool installed on our computer. So 
choose which uh, OS you have. So I'm using Linux, Mac or Windows. I think it's just a downloadable package. Linux is a little more complicated. Um, for Linux, you gotta know your architecture. Most newer computers are gonna be 64-bit. Um, so basically, um, it's gonna take me to a downloads page. So I'm gonna open this release pages up. I'm gonna download the file that I want and I'm gonna get this installed. It will not be this difficult for Mac and for Windows users. Um, it will not be this difficult. So I know I have 32-bit um, Exorcism Linux, 32-bit. So I'm going to uh, copy link location. Um, actually, I'll just, I'll click it and it'll download. Save file. Cool, that uh, downloads to my save folder. And then I'm gonna have to go into my um, <clears throat> command line to, to install it. So, <coughs> sorry about that. Um, so, um, if you're asking 64-bit 60, or 32-bit, um, most, most newer computers are gonna be 64-bit. Um, if you have an old computer, it's going to be 32-bit, but um, most computers are going to be 64-bit. Um, I would, I don't know how to check it in, I don't know how to check that architecture in all, on all computers. I don't know how to check it on Mac or Windows, to be honest. Um, but 64-bit's probably your your option. Oh, I said I had 32-bit. Sorry, yeah, I have, I definitely have 64-bit. Um, I should have 64-bit. This is a VM. It should definitely be 64-bit. I guess I'll find out in a second. Um, actually... Check it here. Great question. Yeah, this my mine is 64 bit. Um, sorry for saying 32 bit. Um, I need I do need the 64 bit. So in my downloads, I'm gonna have to. Um, you can follow exactly what's in here. Um, I know how to do this, but you can copy and paste. I would just copy and paste if you're using Linux and you're not familiar with what to do. Basically, uh, this tar file is basically think about it like a zip file. Um, and all we're gonna do here is. Uh, unzip that and so basically unzips it and we have this exorcism executable and i'm gonna move that to um actually i'm gonna copy it into slash user bin Oh, destination, whoops, uh, exorcism, there we go, cool. So now if I type in exorcism, all right, cool. So I have it, I have it downloaded. Again, if you're on Mac or Windows, um, that should be a lot faster. I, I Like I said, I ran through that fast um, because I need to, like basically what I did was this stuff kind of in one command, um, but don't sweat that. Um, I don't need, I don't think I need this. Um, and then make sure you click on this configure CLI option. This is gonna be the most important one. Even if you just download the executable, we're gonna go ahead and install that. This configures our CLI tool to work with uh, our account. And I'm gonna paste this in. And I've configured exorcism. So um, again, this is, this is, I went really fast there. Um, go through go through the, the walkthrough there. Um, each exercise will have the begin walkthrough. You only have to set it up one time, but this will allow you to use the exorcism CLI. I want you to understand what it is before uh, before we end the stream tonight. Um, and I want, I want to go through a few problems as well. So you'll be able to, I'm confident you'll be able to go through and get that installed. Um, but what I can do now is I can do something cool. Um, I can download, basically they set up some files and some packages for you. And you can download those things. You can download all that information for the challenge. So if I do exorcism, I copied the, the link that they gave me and I downloaded it and it tells me where they download, where I downloaded it to. So I'm gonna change into that directory. You can also just open this up from uh, VS Code and maybe that's best to show you. So I know it's in, Home, Aaron, uh, A. Brooks, Exorcism, go to first. So in VS Code, um, I can actually close all these. Um, I can actually go to file. Ah, oh, my, uh, good. actually new window, that's great. Uh, what is happening? Control, open folder. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm already in my home directory. It's an A. Brooks, it said go, actually, 
What did it say? It said, Averick's exorcism go to, oh, so I need to open up Averick's exorcism go to for, and it'll open up this folder here in VS Code. So with that, I get a bunch, I get a, a couple files here. So I didn't make any of these files. I get a bunch of uh, files here. So readme, readme's are really, really important here. Um, readme's uh, are, it's, it's good practice to put this in um, in the repository or the, the, the code that you create. Readme's will be available in pretty much everything you download, every every um, code, every piece of code that you download, but they give you instructions on how to use that code. Um, and so the instructions for the coding challenge for this will always be in the readme. So you can also have it on the site here, um, but this same information is inside of this readme file. Um, and so you don't need to be on the site to get that information. So we have a coding challenge here. So let's, we're gonna use the tools that we've learned so far to solve one of these coding challenges. The very first challenge was just the hello world. We did the hello world, um, but let's, let's solve this one. So twofer uh, or twofer is short for two for one, one for you and one for me. Um, and so you can kind of already see how like a lot of these coding challenges are kind of stupid. Um, they're, they don't really make any sense. Um, but, um, they, they, they really are just designed to get you to be using those tools, you know, in that toolbox, getting comfortable using those tools. So, um, so I definitely want people to be trying these things out it, it, again. It took me, it took me a surprising amount of time. The first, like when I first started learning how to code to be able to like really solve problems like this. But I think as we go through them together, a few of them together, you'll start to, to kind of see the mindset that you kind of need to have when going into something like this and how you need to analyze it. Um, and that is what I want you to learn more than anything. So um, next class, we're, we're going to be we're gonna be talking about some uh, conditionals and some uh, some some deeper logic. Right now, we don't have a lot of things that that do logic. We have a or, or make decisions for you. We, we, we have a bunch of, uh, of kind of straightforward tasks that we can do uh, commands that we can give the computer to to, to do things. Um, and I think we can use it to solve a few of these problems, um, but it'll be a lot more in depth next time. and We'll solve a lot more problems next time. Um, but let's start with this one. So basically they give you this example of one for X, one for me. When X is a name for you, uh, when X is a name for you. So um, in, in our code, I guess X will either be a name or it will be the, the string you, you saw these, uh, you saw the quotes there. Um, so I, I want you to start thinking like a developer, think like a programmer. You see these quotes here, that means think string. So uh, that's why they put them in there for you. So uh, X is either a name or to you. So we don't really know what that means yet, but we're about to figure it out. So if a name is given, so if the given name is Alice, the result should be one for Alice, one for me. If no name is given, the result should be one for you, one for me. And then it has some stuff about running the test. We'll go over that later. So I actually, maybe I should have selected a different one. This one has some conditionals in it. I guess we'll learn a little bit about if statements tonight uh, as well. Um, yeah, I guess so, cool. Well, let's do that. Um, awesome, so let's go ahead and try to do this code. So basically, exorcism gives you, um, exorcism gives you the, they give you the start of the code. So. You know, we've done a bunch of, uh, we've done some stuff where we had to set up stuff for ourselves. Um, Exorcism gives you the code. Um, and it's got some got some things in here that says, hey, this is a stub file. Um, it's to help you get started um, because they know it can be tough to kind of get started on something. We can delete all of this. It gives you some, some resources that you can use if you need to, but we can delete all this. Um, that's confusing. Um, also ignore, <laughs> Ignore, ignore literally everything that's in this file right now um, as we're going through this because that'll make you really confused because we haven't got to these sections yet. Um, but we're just gonna go through this uh, once to show you how you can use the tools that we have available to us to solve this problem. So in VS Code, if you want, you can do something cool where you can split the pane. And so I can put my code over on this side. All right on this side and then so I can also look at the problem over here on the left. Um, actually, let me, let me see if there's any questions. I'm having trouble breaking through to a DevOps role. Jimmy DevOps has only been showing up in jobs the last few months. That is, uh, breaking through to the DevOps role is is a is always a tough question to answer. Because um, one, it depends on your background. 
Um, your background is pretty important um, <clears throat> in breaking into a DevOps role. Um, the first class we learn at DevOps is a it's it's a culture. It's 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 a it's a discipline that's born out of the experience of its practitioners. Um, so your experience is pretty important. Um, like the, the, the it's. Your experience is pretty important in DevOps. There's, there's so many different concepts you need to understand as a part of DevOps. Um, it's kind, it is kind of tough to kind of break through into what DevOps is. Um, the best way to break into it, especially if you already have some tech experience, or if you're already, let's say you're already a sysadmin, let's say you're already a developer, is to um, is to start filling and start you know slowly filling that void, filling those trenches of you know. I've got the coding side of things down, but I don't necessarily understand the ops pieces. So I don't understand cloud computing yet. I don't really know, although I'm not a right code, I don't know how it's served. Uh, I don't know how it's served up to the web. I don't know how to scale uh, infrastructure to be able to uh, to meet the demand of users and things like that. It's, it's to slowly start to build, fill that void um, to be able to hop into a DevOps role. Um, and then the biggest thing, honestly, is to be able to talk about, it's so hard to talk about this stuff. And the easiest thing, like the best way in is to be able to like talk about what you know. So you go out, you go out and you learn this stuff. The best way to get a DevOps role is to be able to like speak about the things that you've been learning, the things that you know, um, and be able to be able to show someone like, hey, like, you know, I've got I've got this experience, um, but I know all about this stuff um, over here. Like, I have a good understanding of it. Maybe I haven't had time to hands on implement a lot of it, but I, I know what it is, um, and I'm just looking for the opportunity. Um, that would be my advice. Uh, at, um, but cool. Let's not let's knock this out real quick. Um, just so you can kind of understand how exorcism works. Um, so we wanted to spit out uh, one for you, one for me. So we know how to print something out. So we are gonna do actually. We're gonna delete this, and we're gonna we're gonna go with our main uh, the main way we've been building stuff. So package main import. We know we're gonna be printing something out, so we can use that format thing, and we'll leave in our font main. Cool, and we're gonna say we want to see format dot print line, uh, and let's just copy this in one for X, one for me. Cool, that's a good start. Um, and is it doing this to me? All right, so I'm not gonna use a terminal. I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna go go run twofer.go and it prints out one for X one for me exactly what we expected um, cool so now let's solve the problem that they're telling us to do if a name is given um, if the name is Alice the result should be one for Alice one for me if no name is given the result should be one for you one for me cool so what we can do is um, Let's just set up a variable name. We've been using the name variable all night and let's set that to Alice. And when a name is given, so right here we have a name. Um, when it's given, uh, the results should be one for Alice, one for me. So let's see if we can do that. So we showed you um, what's called string interpolation. Uh, this is when you combine a string uh, with uh, variable values um, to make uh, or, or other values to make a longer string or to to combine a complete string um, So we can do one for You can so you can do that interpolation with uh, actually let's use that printf that we were talking about so Let's use printf and we can do one for uh, and we can see those values that we were using before percent V and then comma one for me um and then we need to pass in name so cool so hopefully um, if we use printf properly um name should get put in right here um and name is equal to alice so it should print out one for alice one for me i'll save this and i'll run it here and that's exactly what happens um, a name was given that name is alice and it prints that thing out um but this also says if no name is given, the result should be one for you and one for me. But if I don't give a name, if I if I make an empty value for name, is that what happens? And no, it doesn't. It gives me an empty value, one for blank, 
one for me. So you weren't supposed to learn this the next time, but you can add in some logic to your code. Um, and this is this is what really makes coding, um, you know, a, a great thing, a, a good tool to to really understand. This is where the the, the complicated pieces get in. Um, we can add some logic to this. So let's make the name Alice, and we can add something called an if statement. So very simple. Um, if um, does a it, it basically tries to evaluate something to be true or false. We talked about those Boolean values. So we say if whatever comes after this is true or false, we, we, we can we can choose which one. So we can say if this is true, do this thing. Um, and if it's not do this thing. So you, now you can add in some logic. So I can say if there's a name, um, I'm pretty sure I can just do if name. Um, and that, that checks for if name exists, but let's do something a little um, more explicit so that um, the concept can be better uh, understood. So I can say if name equals uh, Alice through here. Um, if name equals Alice, um, print this out. Um, so I save this and I run it. Um, whoops, sorry. I think only two for what's two for going. I've been writing too much JavaScript lately. Um, cool. So it printed out if name equals Alice, it prints out one for me, one for Alice, one for me. And let's add in a new line after this really quick because this is confusing. And actually, this is back. Oh, that looks good. Please be back. Nope, that's not working. This VM is not doing well. Um, so cool. So one for Alice, one for me. So press that out. But what if, what if the name isn't equal to Alex? What, Alice, what is it going to do? So now it's Alec. And so um, with the logic that we put in here, um, it's checking to see, it's, it's evaluating this. This is what it's evaluating right here. It's, it's checking if name is equal to the value of Alice. So if this is, if this is true, it will do what's in here. And if not, um, we haven't given it anything else to do, it will not do that. So we run it again. It doesn't print out anything because we didn't give it any other rules. Um, and because, you know, this statement is not true. This statement name is not equal to Alice. Name is equal to Alec. Um, so it does not do anything. But we can we can further expand on that. We can say if name equals Alice, um, print that else. Format that print line. And what was it supposed to be? One for you, comma, one for me. So now we have two options here. So if name is Alice, we'll print out this thing. Anything else, any other option, we will we will make we'll we'll make this decision. So now we're we're making decisions based on uh based on our code. So let's save it and see what happens. So actually take a look at it and see what you think it will do. Um, the name is equal to Alec here. Take a look at this and see what you think it'll do. It's Alice, it'll print this out, else it'll print this out. And we run it and it prints out one for you, one for me. Um, just like, kind of like what it says, but yeah, that, that we've, we've implemented that logic and if we make it, turn it back into Alice, it should print out this first option and Cool, one for Alice, one for me. And if I make it anything else, if I make it Bob, it should do anything under that uh, in under that else statement. Now, um, we haven't actually solved the problem because uh, there's some there's some other things that I need to teach you before uh, we can really solve that problem. And I don't want to confuse you too much. Like we need to be able to take in uh, a value, so we don't want to we don't want to have to specify a name in here. We want we want to be able to accept. Uh, name from the outside. Um, so we're gonna learn about all that next time. Um, but you can you can easily see here how you can approach um, solving, you know, read, reading through a word problem and how you can start to kind of solve that problem. So we've implemented the basic functionality. We say if a name is given, um, so if it's Alice or whatever it is, um, it should print out one for me, I mean one for, one for the name and one for me else it should print out one for you and one for me. Um, and we've got our, like the core of our code is right here. Um, and you can see, you know, uh, maybe the syntax is weird. Um, 
and, and, and kind of foreign to you, no big deal. We don't care about the syntax. Uh, maybe I should have wrote this in pseudocode, actually. Pseudocode being um, not an actual coding language, kind of just writing out the logic kind of in words um, so that it's easily, more easily understood. But basically, it's, it's, it's a simple, uh, plain English, like, if this is true, do this, do, if this statement is true, perform this action um else perform this action you could also add in some other operators there's an else if so i could have like um if this is true do this else if this other thing is true so i could say something like uh i actually don't know what the way to do it um is but i think if you do else if name equals bob um do something else um the print do something else and then I can do else uh, format dot print line do something completely different. Um, so you can see how you can start string together logic. Um, you can check for things, you can string together logic and you can use that logic to solve problems. And that is what we will be doing um, next time. So let me, hopefully that was helpful. I, that, that was a that was a quick dive into what exorcism is. Then you can push this stuff up to exorcism after you solve the problem and someone can go through and mentor you on it. Um, but I just wanna introduce you to it um, cause I want you to get it installed on your computer and maybe, um, maybe try just pulling some things down, taking a look at it, taking a look at it. Don't be pressured to solve it, but like take a look at it and write some pseudo or just like see if you can mentally think through the problem they're trying to ask whether or not you can write the code to solve it not a big deal um not a big deal at all um but just i, I wanted to introduce you to this since we're gonna be using it a lot next class make sure that you remember um that you go back and you make sure you understand uh variables make sure you understand you know printing printing uh stuff out to the console make sure you display are able to display uh, output make sure you understand types types are very important Make sure you understand types um, and make sure you understand those math uh, operators. All of those will be important next time. All of those are great building blocks for any programming language for you to look to, to, to know um, and it'll help you solve a lot of problems. So um, hopefully hopefully that wasn't too overwhelming. I thought that was a good way to break it up. Um, those things, you know, we, we, we understand calculators, we understand math, um, basic math. Um, and so that's, that's what we threw in today. Um, and then again, those variables, uh, those different data types are important. Um, I think, I think you guys can take some time and really, uh, get to understand those. And again, these are all things that are transferable to whatever programming language you want to learn. So if you're learning JavaScript, if you're learning uh, Python, you can, um, you can sw switch over to that. No problem. Let me hop back into the comments. Um, uh, we've got a few minutes left. Um, uh, Devos LinkedIn, um, be doing interview stuff. Yeah, the last two courses will be interview stuff. We will we will go through absolutely be going through like what to expect for a DevOps interview. Uh, really a technical interview period. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about a couple different things, but um, specifically a DevOps interview as well. We'll also um, get to talk to uh, various engineers, um, but mostly DevOps engineers from various levels. We'll be talking to someone who is just starting out um who like just got their first like level one junior job we're talking to some some people who are much more experienced than me as well we'll kind of uh, have like a little panel discussion about that um so you can kind of see like like there's a there's a wide range of what people know um there's a wide range of what's valuable devops encompasses so many concepts that like you don't have to be good like all the stuff that we're going through you absolutely do not have to master all of these things um you can probably get a job in technology, maybe not with it with the title DevOps, but you can absolutely get a job in technology with uh, if you master just like two, like not even master, but just have a really good handle on two or three of the topics. I think we're talking about nine or so topics. If you can get a solid handle on two or three, absolutely you'll be able to get a job. If you can learn to talk about each of these things, uh, maybe just get good at one or two and you're able to speak about the rest of these things, there there's absolutely someone out there who will hire you. That's the that's that's, that's really hard though, like um, getting comfortable speaking about, you know, a new topic, a new a new th thing like this, especially when it's technical, it's tough to do. Um, the best way to get good at that is to actually talk to people about it. Um, you'd be interested at, you'd be, it, it, it would be interesting like to, to see your progression and something as you start to talk to people about how much you know, um, it just starts to come out more and more and more. And you're like, oh man, like maybe I know a lot more about this item or this topic than I thought I knew. Um, so. We'll absolutely be going through that interview process for sure. Um, 
AWS Certified Solutions Architect. Now that's dope. Um, uh, I, I, when we get to the AWS section, I'm absolutely going to be pushing AWS certs. I don't really push certs. I don't really believe in many certs have a lot of value um, right now, at least, especially if you're trying to get into DevOps. AWS certs absolutely have value, um, have a ton of value, and they're not, I don't think they're that hard to get uh, personally, the, at least the, the first level, um, well, the first two levels, um, because now they have a certified cloud practitioner and some some like entry level ones um, and then associate level uh, certificates. Um, I don't think they are that difficult to, to, to actually obtain uh, meetups. Um, absolutely. So I, I, I help run a couple meetups. Um, I'm part of a lot of meetups. If you can get out to meetups, get out to meetups, meet people. Uh, so I actually put out a video on YouTube l literally about getting into, you know, hopping into a new industry. Um, and so meeting people is, is, is a great way in as well. Like, um, you know, I, I love to meet people who, you know, who are hungry, who say, Hey, like I'm learning this stuff. You know, do you have any, uh, opportunities for me do you do you have any advice for me um it's it's it becomes pretty easy to look out for those people you know as as people are looking for devops engineers you know the the industry is kind of starving for um for people with these with this skill set um so people are taking kind of more and more junior people because they kind of have to like they they, they either can't afford uh, someone who's you know been in it for a while um or and, and have the time they just need someone fast who can kind of get up to speed um and and really take care of those things so um definitely get out and talk to as many people as you can definitely go to go to some meetups hit up meetup.com uh look for some local meetups to you not it doesn't even have to be specifically about devops program anything tech related um head out to some meetups um cool yeah, yeah, yeah that um this is cool i'll check out this uh i'll definitely check out this blog um that's pretty cool um how can you support the stream subscription helps yeah if you if you want to support the stream absolutely subscribe um follow subscribe subscriptions help um yeah and then share it I, honestly share it my goal is to uh twitch is a twitch is a kind of a, a great platform to be able to share to the masses so um you want to be able to help yeah share some subscriptions absolutely um absolutely help especially if you have amazon prime that you know that's no cost to you but that's kind of the goal of this um to see how we can figure out how to you know um be able to teach people, but also transition the cost of that uh, away from away from the learner. I, I I honestly think with the way technology works, we like you shouldn't have to pay for. You shouldn't I don't think you should have to pay for uh for this kind of information. Um, it's out here. It's it's it, the problem is it's not curated in any type of way. Um, so it's, it gets kind of weird trying to learn it on your own. But um, absolutely, um, all that helps. Um, so can you say if name equals? A string. Um, I wish I read that at the time. Sorry, um, I'm not really sure what you're referring to there. Um, cool, cool. Oh, all these are all these are questions about what we're doing. Um, oh, so could you code? I, I'm assuming the question is, could you code um, this as a boolean? This gets evaluated to a boolean. So basically, it checks just this. It ch it checks what's in here and it evaluates it to a true or false. Um, if it is true. Um, then it will run it. So even if I do something like, um, yeah, it, 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 whatever I put in here, it will try to evaluate it. And if if that state, if whatever statement in here comes back as true, it will run whatever is in here. So um, you can put really whatever you want in there, um, and it will try to evaluate it. Um, and again, the zero value for it uh, for boolean is false. So even if you try to evaluate something that like kind of doesn't make any sense. Um, but it is reasonable for it to evaluate. It will evaluate it um, and it will basically return false and it will run whatever's underneath. Um, oh, exorcism is actually on if. Um, thank you. Thank you, Shu White, for, for that. Um, format scan line to take user input. Yeah, we'll talk about taking user input next time. Um, exorcism is not uh, Sebastian exorcism is not just for DevOps exorcism is actually for uh, coding and programming um, so it's just a tool to help you kind of understand coding a little bit more um, so it's, it's not just for DevOps um, doesn't look like it's um, when we learn PHP Laravel uh, for DevOps I didn't take that route yeah I mean if you want to do DevOps uh, honestly um, if you want to learn for for coding purposes um inside of devops um 
Python's a really safe bet. Python's like a super safe bet. Uh, we'll be going over some Bash stuff. So like, really, if you know some Bash um, and Python and like one other programming language, if you know Bash and one other programming language, you're probably fine. Um, so like, like, and not even really well, just like you're comfortable with the basics and how to solve problems using that language. Again, uh, Python, Golang is a, is, if you're doing some some Googling on DevOps jobs, Golang will come up in a lot of them um, because a lot of tooling is built around it. Um, because it's a systems language and you're generally managing systems, um, Golang is a good one as well. Ruby is another good one as well. Um, I am H in Linux, so yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you if you love Linux, um, that was my way. And I, I started out as a sysadmin and like really like a Linux administrator specifically. Um, and that was my, that was how I got in DevOps. It was, it was, um, it wasn't a hard move to learn the technologies. It was a, it was a hard mental shift and the, like all the new stuff you could do. Like, like when I first got into like configuration management with Puppet, when I saw that you could like write how a server was supposed to be once and deploy it to a bunch of servers at once, like you didn't have to log into each one and make changes. Like, that blew my mind. Like, it was like, it was nuts. Um, so that was really the hard part, like, like changing the way that I was thinking about things, you know, coming from a sysadmin, um, I guess, background. Um, uh, let's see, credit Linux. So that's true, but, um, people still need, I mean, basically you'll, you'll, you'll realize when we get into the cloud section that like, you'll be able to walk, especially if you're good, if, if you're good with Linux and good with systems, um, you'll be able to walk right into a cloud job, like straight into it, to be honest. Let's see. Uh, oh yeah, the perfect there. Yeah, the roadmap.h. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I get this right. Guaravahuda. Um, I'm sure I messed that up. I'm really sorry about that. But yeah, the roadmap.sh um, will kind of show you the path that you can take. Um, this this curriculum is kind of is kind of based off of the roadmap.sh for uh, for DevOps. Um, so you can kind of follow some of the things on there. Um, yeah, let's see. John JS Legacy, or can I start? Uh, you, you can start, you can start on ES6, uh, right away, Sebastian. Um, I started on ES6 right away. Um, I wouldn't, JS Legacy. Um, Yeah, cool. Yeah, and, and like I said, uh, I'll hang up for a few minutes. If people have questions, feel free to ask. Please join the Slack channel. Um, if you if you do uh, exclamation point Slack, um, I'm gonna be hopping in there a lot more. Um, I, I realized I had it. I got signed out of it somehow on my phone. Um, I'm gonna sign back in, but um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be super responsive inside of the Slack. A lot of information will be coming through Slack. So join the Slack channel. Um, there I can answer all all of your questions. Um, if you have some that maybe you asked during the stream that um, that, may, that I may have missed. Um, I'm actually I'm actually gonna try to get someone. I just found out about like uh, the moderators and hosting or and some other stuff. So I'm actually gonna see if I can um, have people kind of host, uh, basically uh, moderate the chat and be able to answer questions that I miss. Um, yeah. Um, so yeah, so definitely join join the Slack. Um, you can ask questions there. Um, ooh, view, view JS versus React. I honestly, in in today's world, I would. I mean, if you're trying to, if you're asking that to like, to to pick one to learn, I would. I mean, I, I feel like you gotta learn React nowadays. Um, uh, all the jobs are looking for React, even though Vue's pretty cool too. Um, there are a lot of jobs for Vue, but like everyone wants React right now. Uh, uh, it's weird because I, although I am a DevOps engineer um, on my project, I have I've um, in the past year I've become the technical lead and it is a software project um, and where we have a JavaScript uh, node react uh, based project. So like I've written, I've written way more react um, than I ever thought I would write surprisingly. Um, I've done way more web development, honestly, than I ever thought I would do, which is, it's pretty fun actually. Um, and it, it kind of makes the journey through DevOps um, actually more fun because I, I have, I have such a, I have, I have a better appreciation for, um, for how the code base works, how like, um, I have a much better understanding of how like, uh, these kind of applications and sites and things are, are kind of built out. Um, and like the, the thought behind the architecture behind them and, and, um, the, you know, the, 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 the best practices and all that stuff, it's, it's been pretty, it's been pretty fun. Um, it's definitely made me, um, 
definitely made me a better DevOps engineer. I think that's the piece that's missing. That's something that should always happen as a DevOps engineer. Uh, generally, nowadays, when people are asking for DevOps engineers, they're really just looking for sysadmins who know the cloud and who can do uh, a little bit of automation, who can write some scripts. Um, but yeah, but like if you really if you really want to be a good DevOps engineer, um, it's it's really good to understand. Uh, what you really want is to understand that entire workflow, understand how the code base works, understand you know how the application works, not just uh, understand the systems that it's running on, um, so that you can um, you know have a have good insight into the entire process. Um, you know that that that's why DevOps engineers are valuable to companies. That's why they honestly they pay so much for them. This is the person uh, or people that they can count on to. Um, to help uh, you know create those workflows, create those pipelines, uh, understand the code base enough, understand the applications ins and outs, um, you know, to to really make an organization kind of uh, kind of fly, kind of excel at what they do digitally. Um, cool. Um, all my cloud computing, the developer starting out. Cool. Yeah. I love the, I love the, uh, I love the chat. Definitely keep talking to each other. If you can take it over to Slack, I am going to sign off now, um, because I had a long day, um, and two hours of talking is a lot, but I really hope this was valuable for you tonight. Please. If you have time between today and Wednesday, start to go over some of the stuff that we went over tonight, especially if you, you know, you're having trouble trying to grasp it, make sure you can, um, you can get go installed and VS code installed on your computer. Um, and exorcism again, I can help with that. Reach out to me in the Slack, reach out to me on social media, um, reach out to the other people, uh, that are, that are, um, that you're conversing with here in the, in the chat, um, we'll help each other out. Um, and let's, let's all get set up for the next, uh, for the next class. And then we'll dive deeper into this logic. We'll spend, uh, we're actually not going to spend long in slides at all next time, maybe 15 minutes in slides and the rest of the time we will be doing problems, working through problems, using code to solve problems. Um, and I think that's what we, I think you'll get the most out of that. Honestly, I had to give you some of the, the basic building blocks today, um, but we'll get all the way hands on um, next time, almost the whole uh, class. But um, the schedule for this, um, if you didn't know, is uh, it's Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, I'm, I'm on the East Coast in the U.S. Um, I'm in Baltimore, actually. Um, so that's the schedule. It's available. If you can't make those times, no biggie. It is available here on Twitch for at least 14 days. Again, I'm working on getting them onto YouTube, but I'm trying to get them there without getting copyright striked um, because of the music that's playing in the background. So someone told me about Handbrake. I'll check out Handbrake. I'll, I'll see what I can do with Handbrake um, right after this, actually, and see if I can remove that music just to be safe. Uh, if not, I'll configure something out for the remainder video, the remainder of the videos, to make sure that they can get up into YouTube without getting deleted. Um, but I will get those there. YouTube drops every single Friday now. Um, first video dropped. First real video dropped this past Friday. Um, check that out. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'm gonna be. Um, I'm gonna be doing most of my tutorials and stuff here on Twitch, um, even outside of the boot camps. But I'll be doing the higher level, um, uh, more conceptual uh, things about the industry uh, over on YouTube um, and kind of talking about that stuff there. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and I will see. You. Oh, actually, I'm gonna see. Epic. Um, I think my sound for my YouTube videos. Okay, I will check. I'll definitely check that out. I found a few options for royalty free music that I will absolutely start checking out. And that's what I was saying. I'll find another option. But thank you so much for tuning in. I am gonna go get some food. I have not eaten dinner tonight. I'm gonna eat real quick. Um, and get ready for Wednesday. Uh, hope to see you all on Slack. See you later.